It's so good to be with the people of God today, praising God. I, um, we know that God inhabits the praises of his people, and uh, we are grateful that he is with us today. We, we have been talking about the force, the idea being that as followers of Jesus, we are called to be forces of change for those with whom God graces us the privilege of influence. Our responsibility is to influence people, spur people Godward, and at other times we are to restrain people from moving in the wrong direction. It is essentially about getting people moving toward Jesus, leading unbelievers to faith in Christ and strengthening the faith of those who already believe. Collectively, as the church, and individually as disciples, this is both responsibility and privilege. It is what we are called to do. It is also what we are graced to do. And when we are faithful to his call, we will be, in the power of the Holy Spirit, effective in our mission. Now, here's the question we're going to wrestle with a little bit today. What exactly does it mean to be faithful? What is it to be faithful to the call? What is God's expectation for believers? His expectation is that we would be faithful, all of us would be faithful with the word about Christ. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says this, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. I think you're probably more familiar with the KJV there that says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, do you understand the implication? doing our part to help initiate faith or to spur growth in the faith requires that we are faithful with the word about Christ. Faith comes by hearing. So expanding the kingdom faith means doing our part to tell his story. Ugh. Dare I ask, when is the last time you shared his story? Sometimes that is sharing the story ourselves, and sometimes it is doing our part to facilitate the sharing of the story. So I'll just tell you, this week coming up, Easter week, this holy week, is the right time to either share the story or do your part to facilitate the sharing of the story. Let me tell you, we're we're going to have probably my favorite worship, my two favorite worship services this coming weekend. Good Friday is a time you do not want to miss. Friday at noon, we will be here to celebrate what Christ did for us. And you can facilitate the sharing of that story by bringing a friend. And then Sunday, we are going to celebrate the fact that he didn't stay in the tomb he was placed in on that Friday, but he was raised from the dead. And we're going to celebrate that story. And Sunday morning is a time that you can invest, invite, and include. You can invest in a friend, invite them, include them in what we will feed them at 9 a.m. if you'll bring them here Sunday morning. That is facilitating the sharing of the gospel. That is, without a doubt, what we are called to do. here's, Here's the reason. Because the word of Christ must be proclaimed. The word of Christ must be proclaimed for people to have faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word about Christ. Do people hear it from you? 
the message, that message is unmistakably delivered by Jesus through the event that we are celebrating today, which is his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. On the calendar, it's Palm Sunday. In real time, it unfolded just as the prophet Zechariah said it would 550 years before it happened. Let's read Luke's version of events in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. We read of Christ's triumphal entry. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, uh, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the fun sponges, that's the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now, historians tell us that it is probable, almost certain, that Jesus' triumphal procession wasn't the only victory march into the city of Jerusalem on that holy week. It had become the custom for Roman governors who were given charge over Jerusalem to come into the city preening like peacocks for the Passover. Theirs was the glory in their minds. Theirs was the glory and the power, and they put it on full display. The purpose of the pageantry was to discourage rebellion and flexing a little Roman muscle with an unforgettable display of power would certainly do the trick. So they marched into the city in full regalia. The cavalry riding on their horses while the foot soldiers dressed in their leather armor and metal helmets carried banners and golden eagles mounted on poles. Those were both signs of power and victory. And it was a vivid reminder for the Jews of the strength and, most importantly, the permanence of Roman rule. The effect of this display, much to their chagrin, incited as much rebellion as it discouraged. See, the Jews had a long history of foreign oppression, and they were tired of the Romans. They wanted nothing more to rid themselves of Roman occupation and reestablish the golden age of Israel that was initially established by King David and his son Solomon. And the fire that burned in their hearts for peace and prosperity was stoked by the scriptures as they read them, which said, one day the son of David will return to the city of Jerusalem and provide for them the freedom and the blessings they desired. Now Jesus coming in from the north down from the Mount of Olives arrived quite differently Pilate came in with pomp and circumstance, but Jesus' procession was humble. There was no pomp, little circumstance, no military might. He was actually riding on a donkey, just like, like Zechariah said he would. 
So while Pilate came in arrogance, Jesus came in humility. While Pilate was fighting to keep something for himself, power, Jesus was coming to give something to us, life. And while Jesus' procession was missing some of the typical trappings of triumph, it had one sign generally associated with significance. There was a crowd, a big crowd. Those closest to him were aware that Jesus had been pointing to this coming Passover as the defining moment of his ministry. This is what he had been pointing to. So among the crowds there were certainly the twelve, his closest friends and disciples. The ladies who had faithfully followed him everywhere were certainly with him. I would imagine that some of those that had been touched by Jesus' compassion along the way were there. Certainly Lazarus, who had raised from the dead, and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Maybe the, the leper or some of the lepers he touched. The blind men whose eyes he opened. And probably many of those that he fed in the wilderness were there. They were all there because they believed that Jesus was sent from God and this was the time that he was going to bring peace to Jerusalem. They fully expected him to overcome and conquer the Roman armies. And so as Jesus mounted the donkey in fulfillment of prophecy, someone in the group took off his cloak and laid it on the ground. He was followed by another, and another, and another, until they created a red carpet effect, welcoming their king into the city of David. They were crowning him king. For the disciples, this was a great moment. It was affirmation that they were right, that they had chosen to follow the Savior. For the crowd, it was a little different. It was the moment they had been waiting for their entire lives. This was their chance to successfully rebel against the Romans. And so, in anticipation of the great victory, the military conquest that Jesus would lead, they began to praise God, quoting the messianic, messianic psalm of David in Luke 19.38, saying, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now the crowd got a little bit out of control. They got too boisterous. And so the watchdogs of the Jewish faith, the Pharisees, stepped into the moment demanding that Jesus rebuke his disciples and muffle the crowd. In, in the Pharisees' mind, the crowds were spouting nonsense about Jesus being a king, and this procession and all the noise it was making was putting them on a collision course with the ever-testy pilot. And if Pilate thought they were rebelling, he would put a stop to the Passover, no buts about it. So, the Pharisees, the keepers of the flame, so to speak, approached Jesus right in the middle of the parade, appealing to his sense of truth, he wasn't the king, and his sense of nationalism, the Passover was the most important celebration on the Jewish calendar, and they said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. This is out of control. Stop it. And how did Jesus reply? Well, curiously for sure. Look at verse 40. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. If my disciples, those who believe in me, 
if those who have expectation for the work that I'm about to do, if they keep quiet, then the rocks will cry out. Now, that is an odd response. Certainly unanticipated by the Pharisees, but it's not odd for the reasons you might think. See, it's not an unprecedented idea. Throughout the Hebrew Scripture, in some instances of injustice and oppression, when no one was there to pray to God or to praise God, the rocks of creation called out to him. Do you remember when Cain killed Abel? What happened? His blood cried out to God from the ground for justice. In Habakkuk, the stones of Babylonian homes couldn't keep quiet about the mistreatment of the Jews in Babylon. And over and over again throughout the Psalms, God's creation bears witness to who he is and what he's about, to his greatness and his glory. So there is nothing surprising about Jesus saying that the stones would cry out if his disciples fell silent. If he was sent from God, then if no one was there to praise him, the rocks would cry out. But here's what's odd. This is a clear departure from Jesus' M.O. all throughout his ministry. Did you know that in Mark alone, five times, there are at least five times, where Jesus forbade people from talking about the miracles, from talking about what they had witnessed or experienced at his compassionate supernatural hand. After healing a man with leprosy who had been locked out of the worshiping community, Jesus sternly warned him not to spread the word about what happened. After raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, he told them to give her something to eat and to keep their mouths shut. He healed a deaf man who was mute. And subsequently, ironically, told him to keep quiet about it. There were several blind men that he healed and forbade to speak about what had happened. Even with his own disciples, after the transfiguration, he told Peter, James, and John not to share what they witnessed until after the resurrection. There were even a couple of times when he instructed demons not to reveal his identity. That's curious, isn't it? Why? Didn't Jesus want people to know that he had come from God? As a matter of fact, didn't he want them to know and us to know that he was fully God, fully man? Didn't he want them to know that the kingdom of God was at hand and victories were being won by people being delivered from evil and suffering? Well, the answer is an obvious yes. He wanted people to know that. But Jesus also understood there was a problem. As news of his miracles began to spread, the very thing that Jesus didn't want to happen was happening over and over again. The miracles were clouding the message and compromising the mission. People didn't really care what he had to say. They didn't really care what he was doing here. What they cared about is that he would serve them. The message was about the kingdom. 
and the mission was about establishing it. But the people didn't really like the message, and they didn't really like the kind of peace it would bring. Because of Roman oppression, they weren't too keen to hear about turning the other cheek. about praying for their enemies. They didn't want to hear about blessing those who cursed them or persecuted them. They didn't want to hear about meekness or service or humility. What they wanted was a demonstration of God's power that would put the Romans in their graves and them in charge. They wanted freedom. They wanted prosperity. They wanted to return to the golden age. And they wanted it immediately. And they wanted more miracles because it was the miracles that they interpreted as confirmation. The miracles, not the message, confirmed their dreams and strengthened their hopes. Or so they thought. So here's here's what was happening to them. And I wonder if it happens to us. Their appetite for the miracles far outpaced their desire for the kingdom. Their appetite for the miracles outpaced their desire for the kingdom of God especially the way Jesus described it. Not unlike us, their desires for the tangible blessings of God were far stronger than their passion for the presence of God. Does that describe you? Is your desire for the tangible blessings of God far stronger than your passion for the presence of God? Because that was true of them, they kept demanding miracles. Because they believed that if Jesus was from God then he would prove it. And he would prove it with a never-ending stream of miracles which would strengthen their resolve, solidify their hope, and secure their future, their political future. Their prosperity. Even the religious leaders fell into that trap. They didn't like Jesus at all, but if he would you know, just keep doing miracles, they might sign up. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now this was after he had given them sign after sign after sign. What they were saying was, show us more, Jesus. The Messiah, if that's who you are, is supposed to be a miracle worker. He will, the Messiah, he will deliver the goods. If that's you, prove it with the sign. Show us one more. The lives you've changed in the past, the blessings you've brought to our community, it's not enough. We just want one more. More blessing, please. More stuff. And look how Jesus responded in verse 39. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign? but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, not a whale but a fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You know what Jesus was saying there? 
It was wickedness that made faith contingent upon miracles. It's wickedness that makes your faith dependent upon miracles. And so he, he, he said, look, there's, there's really only one miracle that's going to reveal who I am. And it's the miracle of the resurrection. Why? Because it was the miracle of his resurrection that would prove not only that he was from God, but that he was God. And so he said, that's the only one you need. That's it. So the reason that Jesus was finally open to the crowds declaring who he was is because his time had finally come. He had preached all the messages he was going to preach. He had completely set the stage for the coming of the kingdom of God. The time had come for him to finish the mission by dying on the cross. And so finally, the chorus of confessors was free to proclaim him as the Messiah. He would not tell them to be silent because their message, whether they got it right or not at the time, was effectively turning all heads toward Jesus. And with every eye trained on him, he would now perform his greatest miracle, the sign of Jonah. He would die on the cross in three days be buried in the heart of the earth. And on Easter Sunday morning, he would raise from the dead. He would now perform his greatest miracle, not healing other people or even defeating the Romans and sending them to their death. But he would perform the greatest miracle by taking the very nature of a servant, becoming obedient to his own death, even death on the cross, dying on that cross. He would defeat death and offer the world peace with God. It was time for the disciples to tell his story. And that time is now. It began then, but it didn't end then. He wanted his disciples to proclaim who he was because now was the time for him to do what he was sent to do, dying a horrible death to provide the miracle of a resurrected life. Not just his, but ours. Did you know that God has invited you to connect with him. And through that connection, the resurrection power, his resurrection power will flow through your life. That's a promise. And it was brought about by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. You know what Jesus said? I'm not going to tell them to be quiet. But if they choose to, the rocks will cry out. Why? Because the story must be told. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the story about Jesus. Now the mindset of the time was that if Jesus was God, then he would usher them into a new age of health, wealth, and prosperity. They had a really difficult time even imagining a Messiah whose role was anything but satisfying these universal, ubiquitous desires. Everybody had them, everybody wanted them, and if God is a good God of love, he will meet our demands. But Jesus would prove them wrong. 
by his death on the cross, by establishing a kingdom, not in the city, but in the heart. And the disciples had to tell the story so the world would know who he was and what he had done. And if they didn't tell the story, the stones would gladly do it. Now, what's the message for us? You know, it's funny. For all the progress, and all the enlightenment, all the education, and all the technology, our world is really no different from theirs. The problem that people have with Jesus then is the same problem they have with him now. Same problem we struggle with. If he's God, and if God is good, then he must get to work extinguishing evil, oppression, and hardship. Why? For the good of good people. If he were God, he would spring into action, give us signs, perform miracles that right wrongs and make our dreams come true. And if he did that, he would prove his worth and that he's worthy, and then we would believe. Have you ever heard someone say, if God wants me to believe in him, he would get, show me a miracle? Well, we know what Jesus thought about that. He deemed that mindset to be wicked. Not off. Not misaligned. Wicked. Now why is that? Because at the very worst it makes us God. And God the servant who does our bidding. We call the shots. And at the best, it ignores our true need and it keeps us groping in darkness. The true story of Jesus must be told. We live in a world that is desperately searching for hope. We search for it in technology, Politics, affirming groups. Medicine, drugs. Anxiety has never been higher, and we've never been more drugged or prosperous. Something's broken. We're groping in darkness. The people you love are groping in darkness. And the true story of Jesus must be told. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the true word about Jesus. And we must tell the story as he lived it. We must tell the truth as it is presented. We must point to the work he did on the cross. It, it, it seems grotesque. It was. It seems brutal. It was. But it's true. And by dying on that cross, Jesus provided us the path to peace. We must point to the work 
that he did on the cross to meet not our immediate needs, but our deepest needs. Listen, we we say it all the time, Jesus came not to make it better, he came to make us better, and what was required to make us better was the forgiveness of our sins, which could only be established by the shed blood of the Lamb of God. Jesus came to connect us with God by offering us forgiveness for our sins. And it is sin, sin that keeps us groping in darkness. So what does this mean to us? We must be faithful to tell the truth of his story as he lived it. We don't need to soften it. We don't need to change it. We don't need to fix it. We don't need to rob it of its power. By taking the blood out of it, or by proclaiming that sin is not real, or that everybody's fine, because we're not. We're not. Jesus, in the life he lived, and the death he died... is the only hope. He is the only hope for a bright and peaceful future. And according to the story, he did not come to save us from our suffering here, but to save our souls from death. The force that we have been entrusted with, the force that demands faithfulness, is the true story of Jesus. We must learn to say with Paul in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And how will they believe? They believe when they hear. Because faith, belief, comes by hearing. And hearing by sharing the word about Jesus. (laughs) We actually have the answer. As a matter of fact, God has entrusted us with the answer. And yet, this great news that we are not ashamed of, we often keep quiet. We do, don't we? The greatest news of all, that Jesus took on death because he loved us, paved the way for life, For some reason at that point, we fall silent. And what Jesus said, if we fall silent, the stones will steal our thunder. And we will miss out on the privilege and the joy of partnering with our Savior in establishing his kingdom. (laughs) 
Let's don't let the rocks cry out on our behalf. The story, the life of his story has the power to change our lives. We must not be silent. We must be faithful to the one who is faithful to us. Let's bow our heads and pray. This good news of great joy, which is for all people, is why we're here. It's why we exist. It is the good news that has changed my life and can change your life. Maybe you came in today and you're, you're not a believer. You're just kind of checking it out. Listen, I've got great news. Great news. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that if you believe in him, you'll have life, resurrection life, abundant life, hope for life, meaning in life, a cause in life. And here's what we believe, that Jesus did exactly what the story says he did. He came, lived a perfect life, was sinless, offered himself by dying on the cross, Three days later, after being buried in a tomb, three days later, he rose from the dead. And he's alive. And his life can be your life. If you're not a believer, there is no better day than this one to embrace the truth that will set you free. Don't believe the lie that if God was good, only good things would happen to you. Because God is good, the best thing can happen to you. You can be forgiven for your sins and connected to your Creator. Because God is good, His son died on the cross for you and for me. Believe it. Open your heart. Let him change your life. God, I I pray for those that just aren't sure. For those who have not heard and believed the good news of Jesus. Let faith come by hearing this word of truth today. Let them step into your love, into your forgiveness, and into the eternal life and peace that only comes through Christ. For those of us who believe, it is our privilege and our responsibility to share the story if the disciples keep quiet, if the rocks will cry out. We can't let that happen. God of grace and mercy, we thank you for your vision of peace for us. May we live in it and share it for your glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.